entrepreneurs, it's like that endless, never-ending game of the quest for self-actualization. Like, how far can I go? How smart can I get? How, how many failures can I survive? How can I stretch myself into being the best me I can be? Because if we stop, I also stop stretching, we start dying. Losing a million dollars, taking a setback, realizing it, whether before, during, or after that is actually a setup. Tell me how you did that. Um, and, and maybe in, you know, what other people could be inspired to take from it is that they could do it too right now. Yeah. So rolling into 2018 and, and really started the, the cracks started forming in 2016, 2017, where I just overextended myself. And then I had a couple business partnerships and things like that, that I thought they were the right person to lead and operate the business as I stepped away. They weren't the right owner operator. I made some mistakes on some of those judgments and I just took too many risks. And I, I knew even when I started like one year, I started three different businesses and I was like, Hey, this shit's going to hit the fan at some point. I'm going to, I'm going to find my breaking point and my edge, but I wanted to find my edge because is when you find that edge, then you're like, ah, that's now, now you know where your edge is and you're not as scared and you can come back and, and, and go at it again. But you know, when I went through that season, I had to, it's a process of letting go to become. And I had to let go of all uh, my real estate. I had, a, uh, my identity was heavily in real estate. I love real estate, but I don't love it as much as the world, the world we're in right now. R growth, human potential, unlocking people's divine potential. That's, that's what I feel like part of my mission is. And, and I was playing out of position. So I, I, you know, I, I realized, hey, I was not in my zone of genius. I was not in my deepest sweet spot uh, of life. Of, uh, and so um, I, I, every day, you know, one of the things I had to do is when you go through the, the grit of life, it's like, man, you got to wake up. You got to control what you focus on. So I, I would literally start my day off in meditation, prayer, read a money mindset book. I read during that first 18 months or so, I probably read 45, 50 money mindset books. Many of them I read four or five times because they're like, I got to, I got to feed my, as I'm putting out fires, you know, at one point I owed like 36 different people. Uh, I had an Excel spreadsheet of all the people I owed. And I was like, man, I got to knock that debt out, knock that debt out, knock that. And, and I couldn't, I couldn't take care of everything because my cash cow business had, uh, had cr cratered essentially because of a, fracturing a business partnership right before we got married and and i'm paying for the wedding we have this beautiful wedding of 70 people in florence italy plus another 100 people in nashville and uh for another celebration so it was like crazy and after after we got married we're like bouncing from hotel to hotel um or airbnb like just hoping hey which bank account will have enough money that we can uh <laughs> get our next night's reservation uh, or next few nights because it was like I'm used I was used to making a lot of money and then yeah. that, that business cratered and I didn't have uh, a mature enough business step fully stepped in but it was mainly I got to feed my mind I got to like I, I knew water was I was going to be taking on water during the day so I got to just feed my mind deep during the mornings handle the fires that I could put out that day and know that I got to let some fires burn until I can get to them. And that's, that's just what I did. And uh, step by step, uh, having a wonderful wife, that was a, a key component of purpose and mission. And, and also just wanting to not let people down. And I knew I was capable of great things. So, and I'd already done a lot. It just, things, things didn't go right in, in a certain season. Uh, it was, yeah, it's, it's amazing how much you can feel like you've accomplished and then realize it was that one little blind spot that just all of a sudden just comes out of nowhere. It's like, it's like turning to look, have you ever seen the, uh, have you ever seen the footage? Do you know who Rudy Tomjanovich is? Only yeah. 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 Have you ever seen the footage of him getting punched? No, maybe I did back in the day with, uh, when he was at the Rockets, right? Well, he was the coach of the, yeah, yeah. So he was playing back in the day. So he was later the coach. I'm from Houston. So I, you know, I cheered and we watched Rudy T win championships and all that. But when he was a player and there's a, actually a book written about it called the punch wow. and it's Rudy T is running. And there's this other player, Kermit Washington, who's standing there 
and Kermit's like a big, strong guy, c- comes from like a really hard neighborhood, you know, the, the hood, right? And he's standing there and he just kind of senses this guy walk, running up behind him. And it just instinct, he just turns and Rudy T runs, you know, sprinting up the floor. So you got probably 25 mile per hour going this way and a 30 mile per hour punch going that way. Wow. And Kermit's a big dude. And it basically pushed his nose up under to the underside of his brain. Then he had spinal fluid leaking down the back of his, his throat. And, and it was just, but here's the thing, man. He never saw it coming. Jeez. The, does that resonate? Yeah. Right? Like it's the yeah. one thing you're like, I never, I was running, man. And I had, I never in a million years imagined that somebody on the other team was just going to punch me. <laughs> and that's how it is. Whether it's a business partner, it's that one property that the roof caves in and the tenants move out and then you get sued and then you don't have the cash and then the bank takes it. And then it just, the, the, it only takes that one domino. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, man, it, I'm, I'm curious. How do you, and I have my own answer to this, but I want your answer, knowing that you'll, you'll probably never know what it is that's going to get you until it gets you. Mm-hmm. How do you live with the decision to do it again? I can't not do it. At the end of the day, you can't, like, you can't, you can't live without it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's the, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial list, um, you know, we are, we're irrationally optimistic. I mean, if you look at the actual stats, I think I read the illusions of entrepreneurship, a book that, uh, uh, I read years ago and it said like something like only 10% of entrepreneurs actually really, really make it and make more money than they would have made in a job. Yeah. And, and so we're all like, uh, I'm going to be that 10% for sure. I'm going <laughs> to figure it out. We got to have that foolish. It's the same foolishness that I think, uh, you know, men would go to war in, you know, World War One, World War Two. like, man, it, just that we don't, and we don't know the the cost usually when we get started. But even, even now, like, I know some of the painful costs, but I'm like, it's like I stared death in the face, and I lived, and I'm good. I got, I'll, I can stare death in the face again, and I think I'll win again. And I, I, yeah. I'm not going to get defeated. It's like, I'm going to get stronger, faster. And I knew part of it was also, I'd read so many books. I've read 1500 books at this point. And I read books like Failing Forward and biographies of all these other entrepreneurs, leaders, et cetera, knowing stories like yours. Like I have so many friends and connections that I knew, ah, oh, they went through loss. They went through heartache. They went through setback, or this was ripped from them or whatever. And, and, um, or they made a bunch of dumb mistakes. I'm, I'm not going to mm-hmm. scapegoat. It was a, a lot of, most of it, 98% of it, I probably could have prevented in some way. Um, and I'm going to take ownership so I can live through it again. Um, but, uh, like I knew those stories and those were the, the wind behind my sails in those moments. Yeah. And you know, it's, it actually is, I mean, you, you allude to one of the reasons I started this show and, and while I'll, I, I mean, as many episodes, as many interviews as we can book and I can, you know, handle is how many episodes of this show there are yet to be created. I mean, we will never run out of folks like you, inspiring people who dig deep, find that, you know, grit and tenacity. And, and by the way, I've never had anyone on this show who didn't, who, who like it just, everything just worked. Yeah, I've never met that guy. It never just works. It always mm-hmm. is hard. It always is ugly. It always defies logic. It always questions sanity. And it's always mm-hmm. the right, but it's always right. And there's an infinite number of people out there that are proving to the world. I hope, you know, the impetus of the show is like, eventually, there will be enough of these episodes where we've covered every base, we've had every skin color, we've had every socioeconomic level, we've had people that have every imaginable origin possible that have done amazing things despite great hardships. And eventually, it'll be impossible to say it can't happen for me. Yeah. Because we featured enough Mike Zellers. Yeah. I'll hit it back to you. You've, shared, you've talked about how I knew that I was psychologically unemployable and would never fit in that box. How did you come to realize that you weren't going to fit in that box either? You know, I was, um, I was doing mortgages uh, right after grad school, and I wanted to get into the real estate industry. And, and I started, I bought my first rental property, that type of deal at age 25. 
And I just, man, I did not, I could immediately tell that I didn't have a boss and being directed while I like the training, mm -hmm. I, like the regular expectations, you're showing up at these hours, you got these rules and regulations. I'm a, I'm a creator and a uh, year and a half in, I left that and haven't had, except for a brief stint uh, for about two years as a part-time CMO, founding CMO for a start investor back startup. I haven't really been an employee for, you know, 15 years, 16 years. And, and when you have it in you, like some people develop the entrepreneurship muscle. And I think some people are innately just predisposed that they must do it. Right. Like if you, it's death to our soul, if we do anything else. And uh, um, so I, I'm one of those death to my soul of the, I, I am so confident, I guess, that I can figure things out and I'm meant to create um, that working for someone would be might as well drink poison so you you honed in on one of the fundamental attributes of of entrepreneurship and and and, and i don't even just you know a little insight into my vernacular and my world and my way of thinking i don't even really use the term entrepreneurship that much i've stopped actually calling myself an entrepreneur and i've stopped thinking of myself as pr practicing entrepreneurship and I'm now describing myself as an entrepreneurialist mm -hmm. and I'm a practitioner of the philosophy of entrepreneurialism. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more not to get overly semantic and, and silly, but like, it's not so much like, Oh, what job, what, what's your job? Oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I build businesses. No, it's like, it's more like saying I'm a Buddhist. Yeah. Like you don't do, you don't do Buddhism for a living. You're just a Buddhist. Yeah, for yeah. me, I'm an entrepreneurialist. It's a way that we see the world. It's yeah. a way that we process challenges. It's a way that it's a standard that we hold ourselves to. It's a choice about how we're going to show up in this world and what kind of an impact we're trying to have in this world. And the nice thing about it is in worldly, um, you know, terms based on conventional metrics of, of reward, it happens to pay very well if you do it really well. Mm -hmm. And it happens to create a lot of nice perks. Um, but like, even that, you know, it's kind of like, and, and I do liken it to Buddhism. I'm strictly speaking, I'm not a Buddhist, but there's a lot in Buddhism that's like, you know, and stoicism too, around like the obstacle, the obstacle is the way and stuff like that. Where like, you know, you kind of wake up one day and you realize like, okay, I have money, I have freedom. And I'm curious if you've ever experienced this where you kind of get to this point, you're like, man, I got everything that they always said was impossible. And it doesn't really mean a damn thing unless I go even deeper than what got me here. Yeah. You ever feel that? 100%. It's like, you know, back in 2017, uh, I had three, no, sorry, it's about six active businesses at the time and 55 employees, we were doing like 30, about $30 million in total revenue uh, at that time. And I had a test, I had my two dream cars, BMW M3 and a Tesla. Uh, you know, t I had the souped up Tesla with a ludicrous mode. And I love that. Like those were my, on my vision board, right? And, um, but they didn't satisfy me. It was the quest for, for, it's really the quest. I think entrepreneurs, it's like that endless, never ending game of the quest for self actualization. Like how far can I go? How smart can I get? How how many failures can I survive? How many mistakes? Whatever. <laughs> like how can I stretch myself into being the best me I can be? Because if we stop, also stop stretching, we start dying, and uh, and so we got to be you know careful with what we feed. And one of my favorite quotes is, "You feed what you want to live and starve what you want to die." And for me, I, I want to keep growing. Like I want, I want to be like Peter Drucker, 98 years old, yeah. still writing books, still teaching, still speaking, still mentoring. That's a big part of my mission. And I quote Peter Drucker virtually every day. Really? Yeah. yeah where, you, you know, his, his stock response to every strategic management question, you know, he's like the father of management theory, obviously, and whatever. Yeah. He would always come back to the culture, man. He would say, the culture is the strategy. It's like a Peter Drucker quote. The culture is the strategy. Good. We say that every day on some meeting in my organization, some way, somehow that always gets said where it's like, bring us, bring it back to the culture, man. And the reason I, I say that 
you know, partly so we can have our little moment, our little Peter Drucker fan geek <laughs> moment. But it's true in life too. It's true in life as much as it is in business. It's interesting in business, there's all this talk about culture, right? Like, cause you know, especially as the tech thing has happened, there's like new variations on office culture, like the open office, eliminating silos and like, what's the culture? And oh, there's a cereal bar and we get there early and have breakfast and we chat and play, you know, foosball or whatever, like culture. But you and I both know it goes way deeper than that. But also, why are we never talking about the culture that we're creating in our life? Why is it this thing where it's like, oh, in a business where we want to have a high performance process and, and outcome, and in order to do that, you need to create a high performance culture. I don't know. I don't know. It seems very arbitrary to me, to me not to approach your entire life the exact same way. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, maybe talk about that. What's, what, how, how have you built your, cult, your personal life culture to produce the Mike Zeller that we see every day? Yeah, so I lo love that emphasis. Culture is the strategy. And, the, and I, I want to add another layer. For me, I, I ask a lot of my um, clients and a lot of my mastermind members, even like my own wife, like, hey, what, is the, what does my environment need to look like for my success to be inevitable? Mm. No matter what, like it's going to happen, right? So if, if we become environmental designers, of our life. And, and so that's the culture, the culture. If I, Hey, I'm not tolerating these sorts of things into my life. I'm not tolerating. Like I, I have a culture in, in my masterminds in my, like we just, this, this big abundant you challenge. And we eliminate word, what I call weak ass words. So we got words that I feel like they neuter us. They dis they make your spine grow weaker. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I try, I hope to, I would love to, would love to means I want to, but I can't. So when right. I say those words, we're actually reinforcing, I can't do this. And um, so if you eliminate those things and you start creating the culture, now my everyone calls me out. If, if I do a weak ass word, if my wife says a weak ass word, if I say a weak ass word, boom, it's called out. It's not tolerated. Um, and, and then also stories of limitation. You know, I, as we've talked briefly before, it's like, hey, you know, I went through a season where I lost a million dollars. That was a really freaking hard season. I had built up a bunch of things, had to sell a bunch of things, had to get rid of things, had to, you know, and that was brutal in many regards. And I also got married during that season. And, and, and then, but, but then the culture of, I'm not going to let that hold me back. That was a setback. That was a setup. And, and so I've used that and channeled it. And last year was my most profitable year yet. This year will be triple or quadruple that. So what I'm always you know, always trying to do is get down to the 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 kryptonite, the je ne sais quoi, the like, what is that fire and why the mm. fuck can't we give it to everyone? Mm. You know. So I'm curious, where do you think it comes from for you? Yeah, you know, for me. So uh, have you done the wealth dynamics yet? No. You know that personality test. My no. favorite. Tell favorite me, please. Test. Yeah. So. It's part of my uh, zone of genius process, but uh, Roger Hamilton created the test um, and it's a phenomenal test. It's my favorite test for entrepreneurs. So I'm a creator. Creators, um, creators at the core, there's eight profiles. Like there's a Lord. Lords are empire builders. They're like the Rockefellers and the Carnegie's. They typically stay in one industry one, and they just keep building, 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 building. Creators um, like uh, Walt Disney, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, they they like living on the edge. Disney yeah. went bankrupt a couple times, you know, or once uh, Steve Jobs kicked out of his own company. Elon Musk has <laughs> been on the verge of disaster uh, at least half a dozen times. Um, uh, so those type of, and then you got stars. Stars are like, man, they, they can be in the limelight and they just bring pizzazz and energy and brilliance. So creator, uh, it's like, I love the art of creating. I am fulfilled in the art of creating, I'll have to on the back end now that I got a you know baby on the way and I got all these other things. I got to be wise about my risk management, and especially as I flirt, you know, I want to sit, this next season is going to be my. It's already becoming my most prosperous season ever in my career. Um, but I got to step into that and I got to like manage the risk. But um, it, knowing your wiring, 
So a lord is going to be much slower to take risk. An accumulator, a Warren Buffett, he's an entrepreneur, but he, the way he leads and the way he does entrepreneurship, radically different than a Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. So we can all be entrepreneurs, but we'll approach it very differently based on our wiring, our risk tolerance, our energy, our stories of uh, you know who we've been exposed to. Um, so um, you know, some people might need to work in a career or industry for thirty years before they become an entrepreneur. Some like me or you, you're like, uh, I can't, I can't not do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm uh, I actually just pulled up the wealth dynamics test and I'm sending a link to my ops team right now. Like, uh, this seems like, you know, cause we're in the business of, of helping people find their entrepreneur, you know, mm -hmm. similar to you. Right. Yeah. I, I think you're, I get the sense you're working with people that are pretty already convicted i'm an entrepreneur and you're like okay let's make sure we're pointing you in the best strategic direction i've got people that are coming in saying i want to be an entrepreneur because mm -hmm. i see the benefits but i don't even know if i am or how to be right and so i'm mm -hmm. like I, it sounds to me like something that this wealth dynamics assessment would be essential of like oh, and, and we're it's funny we actually have our own thing that we're we're in the process of developing right now called yeah. your entre dna which it's it's your entrepreneurial DNA, what type of entrepreneur you are, but it sounds like this is a, uh, somebody's already blazed that trail for us. We could probably go flatter yeah. with a little bit of creative interpretation slash imitation, right? <laughs> exactly. Yep. It, it sounds powerful. It, it's great. It's, it's so revelational for, I mean, most of my clients, that's, that's why I featured in my book as well as like, man, it gives you a lot of clarity. So, so, so talk a little more about this, this zone of genius concept. I think that's a term that entrepreneurs, we kick it around like it's every day, but I'm not sure it is for the rest of the world. So can you talk about it? Yeah. So, you know, one of my first clients that I really took through the full process, he, um, he, he, he was a full time, he had a chiropractic practice, seven figure chiropractic practice, but he had been doing it for 20, 30 years. We, we did a full analysis. He was earning essentially 2000 bucks an hour for every hour they put in it. Um, but he wasn't fulfilled um, and he was longing for something more. And, 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 I, and I started thinking about like, because even, you know, in my, my wiring, I'm an INTP on the Myers-Briggs, which is yeah. curious. Like I want to understand things. And so I started, I started in my twenties of like, Hey, why, why is this person different over here? Like at first it was probably to understand girls because I, I was right. not very good at dating girls in my twenties, in my early twenties. I was awkward, clumsy. I was like, I got to understand human psychology and how to relate and communicate because I, I was, I was a uh, super motivated, but like just socially awkward and not very funny. Right. But, so, so I uh, started studying it and I was like, Hey, we all long for purpose. So we are asking that core question, one of the three central questions we all ask at some point or another is what on earth am I here for? And then I started asking, all right, personality tests give us clues. But if I take the disk profile, I get some different answers than if I take the Myers-Briggs or if I take the Strengths Finder, or the Colby or the Wealth Dynamics or the Enneagram or whatever personality mm -hmm. test you take. So they give, but they all give us, it's like I'm looking at different pieces of the same elephant and or the same puzzle, right? But then our relationships, there's clues in our relationships. Like that, I, you know, I love talking to guys like you, right? Like we're up to something, we're creating, we're innovating, we're taking risks, we're living on the edge a little bit. Um, we're making something out of nothing. Right. Um, so that's, that's what juices me. But if I go talk to a banker or a regular attorney, I'm like, ah, I don't want to have dinner with them. <laughs> you know? uh, it's just death to my soul. So I was like, ah, so I started paying attention to that. Then the next thing, life experiences well like the one of my clients i'm talking to here in a little bit she's one of the leading cardiologists in the world or in, in north america and um guess what she wants to start she wants to start this movement around heart intelligence and heart awareness mm -hmm. so that's a clue she doesn't really want to be a cardiologist anymore like in the medical field but her life experiences gave her clues that hey oh there's you studied the heart for some reason, you were drawn to that. Now it's not by accident. Then the last piece is the values and passions. Like there's things that we stand for and there's things that we stand against. So when you put all, all of it together and then you have innate passions and just, you could learn about this all day long. Like if you look in my office, I got probably a hundred books that I haven't read and a, uh, at least 500 that I have read. 
<laughs> right. And I'm still curious about all these things. So, um, so then you put them all together. No one had organized the accumulation of clues in the way I, I started organizing. And then like, I literally talked to uh, someone bought a one-on-one -on -one session with me after they bought the course and did all the homework. And she's like, Mike, if I had taken this course before I stepped to this new job, I would have commanded a 50% better salary because I would have known how to position myself and I would have owned my greatness and my worth at another level. And, and then when I look at entrepreneurs, like you're going to do your business a little bit differently than mine. Uh, my friend Renee, she'll do, she's wired differently. She's got different life stories. She's got different relationship pool. I'm trying to assimilate and create a filter like this is your unique badass zone that is different from everyone else. Yeah, I mean, and and having, I guess, gone through that, uh, my version of the same journey and, and quest to find mm -hmm. mine without a guide like you or your book, um, I can say from experience that when you find it, everything changes. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of people that think something happened to me in the last few years. Like, who was this guy and how what this thing he's building this is a different thing. This is not like his other things. That's all that changed is I kind of figured out actually what I'm really great at. Yeah. And I've been able to create a business that allows me and that is a product of mostly me being able to focus on what I'm great at and not have to tend to everything that I'm not. And mm -hmm. some of that is how you build the business and some of that is what business you build. Yeah. Um, but man, the value of, of having that intelligence, you know, it's taken me 20, 20, it took me probably 24 years of being an entrepreneur. I started as an entrepreneur 16. I wouldn't say I got it right till I was 39. I'm 42. Yeah. I'm 42 too. It shouldn't have to take that long. I mean, <laughs> it's, is it, isn't this what school is supposed to do for people? Yeah. Well, that, that's why guys like you and me exist is we can, we can reach and equip people and, helps help them save the blunders that we made. And, uh, um, and, and I love what you sh shared there too. It's like, I think it fundamentally, extraordinary success is knowing how to put yourself in extraordinarily right positions. Mm -hmm. When we do that, then, then things start humming and clicking and it's less of a struggle. It doesn't mean there's not hard work and grind and all that at different points, but it's less of a struggle because you're just, you're doing something the way I like to think about it is like, where am I desperately needed that no one else could do at the level that I can? When I figure that out, now, now uh, I'm one of the best heart surgeons in the world, or I'm one of the best, you know, you've built the, your program, like Entree, what's it called? Entree Entree, Entree Institute. The Entree Institute. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you've got a really unique combo of, of helping people figure out that next step of like, is this right for me? And then if so, how do I make it right for me? That's beautiful. Like that people need that. Like that's a massive need because entrepreneurship has got such buzz or interest right now, side hustle and all that. But people will, will shoot themselves in the foot without going through programs like yours where they get clarity, more clear. clarity precedes momentum. When you have yeah. greater clarity, you can lead with greater conviction and greater confidence and greater courage. Um, and every, so it's like the C's keep rolling. The clarity is where it starts, though. Yeah. Yeah. Have you are you familiar with a, a concept called Ikigai? I have heard of it. Yeah. 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 It's like a Japanese. Um, I'm trying to remember what the actual word Ikigai means, but it's a Japanese concept that's attempts to do to create that same alignment and clarity for people. Um, it might be interesting for you to study it. I K I G A I. I was exposed to it. I interviewed a guy named Chris, um, Chris Doe, who's got a YouTube channel called the future, mm -hmm. which is uh, got no E it's F U T U R the future with no E. And he, he talks about and teaches about Ikigai and it's, he works with a lot of creatives and designers and, you know, visual artists that are trying to build, you know, it's such a passion, passionate, creative trade that a lot of times it doesn't attract people that, they, that are necessarily inherently great at building a business. Yeah. Um, and so he tries to help creatives, you know, also build viable businesses. And um, the concept of Ikigai is basically taking what you love, what you're great at, what you can actually get paid for and what the world needs 
and merging and finding the the overlap of those venn diagrams um and it's so true man it's so true so so talk to me then you know i mean can you walk without giving away all your ip like let's say somebody comes to you which i hope at the end of this episode people do and they're like okay mike i i want to I love the idea that I'm already a genius if I can just find my zone. So, so mm. get me there, man. Like, help me. What, what does that look like? Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which shows you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Good question. So, you know, first thing, it's it's going to involve, like, when someone goes through my full process, it's it's literally you're reading hours of information about yourself because you'll take five personality tests, and then you do a deep inventory. You know, the book, the classic book is called Think and Grow Rich, not Work Hard and Grow Rich, not Get Oh, you mean this rich. book right here? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and so the thinking time is where the magic, that's the hardest work. And that few people do. You yeah. Know, Socrates said, to know thyself is the beginning of all wisdom. In the ancient Greeks, that was one of their hallmarks on the temples is know thyself. You know, King David said, it's better to have self-control than to conquer a city. Um, and so if we have that self-control, that's where it starts. D. Hawk, the founder of Visa, he said the very best leaders in the world, uh, and he, he founded Visa, sold his equity out, and then studied leadership for the last 25 years of his life. And he found the very best leaders uh, were focused on self-leadership. They spent more than 50% of their time on self-leadership. Um, so I would take I'd take someone through the Wealth Dynamics, Strings Finder, Myers-Briggs, Disc Profile, and Colby Index. Then a deep inventory of your key life experiences, like your timeline, your defining moments in life. Oh, I hit a home run and fell in love with baseball or whatever at this day, or, you know, all these things. Like I, I have a passion and interest for uh, NFL. I love the NFL, right? Um, sorry about your Houston Texans right now. I know they're in complete chaos. Yeah, seriously, right? <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I, that's not a passion that's ready to be birthed into life, but I'm, I know it's there. I want to own part of an NFL franchise in my 50s. Mm -hmm. Next one, I go to my key relationships. I know when I did that inventory, I'm like, oh, I've got, I, for at the time, for someone who hadn't written a book, I was like, why do I have 30 plus best selling author friends? Oh, maybe I'm supposed to be in that world. Why do I love being around them? Um, and then all these other entrepreneurs. Then the last thing, your values and passions when you when you do a deep dive of like hey what are the values that you live for and then and then what are the passions and so you go through all that and, and it's like a 12 page worksheet <laughs> that people get in my my course but when they go through that um or in my book same thing um the genius within so when they go through that man now you've got layers of clues and evidence and you start you've got got all the information on the table and now you can start to filter and organize and synthesize and assimilate and like, oh, I think I'm supposed to be in this arena. Kind of like the icky guide thing that you were talking about there, which I hadn't heard of. So that that sounds great as well. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's so cool. And and so what do you see happen? Well, first of all, how how did and you kind of you kind of touched on this, but maybe you could kind of make it more specific, like. How did you arrive? I mean, clearly you were your own first guinea pig for this, mm -hmm. right? Probably not in a perfectly crafted experiment. It was probably kind of messy <laughs> and, you know, more like real life. But yeah. how, how did that unfold? And how did you kind of get to this place of, you know, A, realizing that this concept existed and B, that part of your genius was to facilitate this concept? Yeah, you know, I think uh, when I first started mentoring people, uh, other entrepreneurs uh, in about six years ago, that was one of the core questions they were asking. And I had asked that myself and I'd studied some of it, like I was using Strengths Finder and Disc Profile and, and hiring, but also in designing my businesses and working mm -hmm. with my business partners. But then I was like, I need more. There's more here that, and I, I wanted to give people, help people land on uh, accurate answers. Um, and so I just started with the first version. And the first version was I had people do the wealth dynamics test and on my one of my retreats. 
in uh, 2017 it was and uh and do skits and share and share what what they act like a mechanic a mechanic is a systems ninja and uh you're a creator so then you do a skit that reflects that and i was like all right there's something really people are really different and when you value their differences and create space for them to flourish in their differences then we light up as human beings um even in children right like we can already tell some things about our our baby that she's probably an introvert um mm -hmm. just how she reacts in the womb um so being a student of life and uh, that drove me to to it and then i just kept iterating and I kept asking myself hey what do people need to know to have greater clarity doesn't mean you figure it all out like people might go through my program or your program or whatever and they get go from 40 percent clarity to 55 percent oh yeah but now when you have greater clarity, you have greater confidence. And now I can make a more decisive choice because I have greater confidence. So the clear, it all begins with clarity and, uh, and you can run in the wrong way. I've run hard in the wrong way and it will cost you more pain, more sorrow, more money, and sometimes cost relationships too. So I wanna help people avoid some of those foolish blunders that are avoidable. It reminds me of the scene in uh, Dumb and Dumber when I guess Harry's been driving all night. No, Lloyd's been driving. Lloyd's been driving all night, and and they wake up and they pat. They think they see a sign that says Omaha. Yeah. And they're supposed to be going to Aspen, and it's like you drove us six hundred miles in the <laughs> wrong direction. <laughs> oh, that's the worst, man. And I've so been there too as an entrepreneur. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um. So, so yeah, and you know, it's interesting, you talk about um, how different people are. And I think this is something that it took, like I said, let's say I've been an entrepreneur now for 26 years, I think it probably took me over 20 to realize, A, people are really different. And it's not just, oh, well, the ones that are more like me are the more right. And the yeah. ones that are less like me are less right. They're just more right at other things or more mm -hmm. right at who they are and less like me. And I, it's like, so, but to, to, but you, then you, you know, you're in, you made a comment too. That's interesting about like, there's just some people that we naturally like being around. Mm -hmm. And I think we tend to, and I did this for years. I did this for decades to think that the people I like being around and frankly, the people that like being around me, that that's actually the better way to be. Mm -hmm. And then if you're less like me and I'm less like you, it's pro it's just because you're less good. I mean, this, it sounds terrible to say it, but like we all kind of operate that way as our default, yeah. right? But to really learn, it, it doesn't mean you have to like everybody, but to value those yeah. different, you know, it's like the, the different gemstones, right? An emerald and a sapphire may not agree on everything, but they're both beautiful. Yeah. And you put them together and you can make some magical stuff, right? And, and now that I am, you know, I'd say for the second time I'm growing what I would call a real company, not just a business, not just a solopreneur who figured out a hack to make some good money or, and I don't mm -hmm. have any problem with small. I mean, I know a guy, you know, he's like a, has a three person organization and they own, you know, $120 million worth of real estate. It's great. Like I, I'm not mm -hmm. knocking that, but when you start building organizations, which, which you kind of have to do if you're going to go make some real noise in this world, yeah, you got to learn to value people. In fact, the less like you they are, the better in some ways. Mm -hmm. If you want to build a, a sturdy organization. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, uh, sports metaphors are among my favorites. You look at yeah. Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. Dennis Rodman, dude, was crazy. He was wild. He's going to Vegas and hanging out with Carmen Electric on weekends. Right. And, uh, but he, he did not care to take a shot. Yeah, he also, I was going to say, averaged like 1.2 points a game, too, for like, for a <laughs> Hall of Fame career. I mean, it's hilarious. Yeah, exactly. And he, he was, he knew his role, and he flourished in it. And it's like, one of the things is like learning and loving your role and not trying to, if I, I think some of my entrepreneurial career, I, I start, I wanted to be a bit like Warren Buffett or something like that. And that's not my style. And then when I learned my style more, then I also learned the risk and how to manage it. So I read, 
you know, as a creator, I've read Elon Musk's biography, Richard Branson's biography, Steve Jobs' biography. I read and study the other people that have my gifts or my wiring. So I know, all right, this is how they manage themselves. This is how they manage away from their weaknesses, how they design their teams, how they, like Richard Branson sucks at operations. He doesn't start a business without an operating partner. Right. So like that's, that's in my head. Like, how do I do more and more of that? Is that, is that how you are? You know, I, I haven't figured out the exact formula for finding the right operating partner, but I need to, um, I'm hunting for it. Yeah. So um, the COO type is what I really do need in the follow through the full execution. And I'm getting closer. Like I'm building out my, my coaching team. I have a stronger partnership team and it's, it's much healthier and balanced than it was four years ago. Yeah. It's interesting as an entrepreneur, you know, typically entrepreneurs are going to be at least part, part visionaries, right? Like we see possibilities in the world that don't currently exist and that a lot of people may say never could exist or would exist but we see it we believe in it we go after it we create it and when we win the world change it's actually you know what's that quote by Bertrand Russell Bertrand Russell I love this quote and he says the reasonable man adapts himself to the world the unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself therefore all progress depends on the unreasonable man right we're unreasonable. That's, that's part yeah. of entrepreneurs. And we tend to like other unreasonable people like you and me, but man, <laughs> you and me put it, you and putting you and me together to run a business would probably not be a great idea. No, no, no you need yeah. operators. Yeah. Like, and you need, frankly, more, it takes more of them than ideators and visionaries to build great things. And so to learn to value this has been one of the biggest breakthroughs for me to just like, I have fallen deeply in love with people that I used to think were annoying mm -hmm. because they like, they mm -hmm. want to like ask, well, how are we going to do that? They want to ask these annoying practical questions. Right. <laughs> and I've fallen so well, in love with plan? them <laughs> because you can maybe make yourself six figures. If you're, if you're lucky, you might even make yourself seven figures, but you want to build something that, changes the world never mind the the number of zeros you got to fall in love with all the stuff that you don't naturally like yeah yeah you know? and you look you know for us as creators you might be a creator on the wealth dynamics it's like walt disney has been gone for you know 40 50 years right how many employees does disney still have what, a quarter million or something i mean it's crazy yeah and how his vision is still being carried forth. His ideas are still being carried forth. We were just at Disney World a few weeks ago. And there's a story of in the 70s, I think when uh, Disney died, Walt died, um, he died right before Disney World opened. Yeah. And someone came to him, came to his brother, Roy, and was like, man, it's such a shame. Walt never got to see this. And Roy said to him, you're wrong. He saw it before any of us did. He saw it the whole time. Yeah. He had it in his head. And then Walt, to his credit, knew how to have the right partners and support and execute to bring that to fruition and appreciate that. And that's why Disney is still carrying on. And it wasn't just another half-baked idea. <laughs> Walt was probably sitting there going, I think it's a damn shame that it took everyone else so long to see this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, speaking of Disney, I, I love that uh, organization. I, you know, my for one, I have a four-year-old girl, so I get to play Disney princess dolls every night before bed. But um, I've learned all their names. I know, I know um, Tiana from Princess and the Frog. I know who's the girl from Brave. I always forget her name. The redhead, like the, I've, yeah. I've, these girls, literally, like I, I dream about them too now. Um, but uh, but. But man, the, the amount of invention that goes on in Disney World. I read an article a couple of weeks ago about why there are virtually, I mean, it's in Florida, it's in a swamp, mm -hmm. but there are virtually no mosquitoes yeah. at Disney World. And it's the crazy. amount of science and thought and planning and operational precision that goes into just keeping the place generally free of mosquitoes is unbelievable. There's, I mean, it's the... It's the largest single site employer in the world. 
It's larger than many pretty good sized cities and nowhere on the entire surface area of Disney World is there more than like six inch diameter of standing water. Yeah. That's not circulating. There are no puddles yeah. in Disneyland, in Disney World because mosquitoes mm -hmm. breed in still water, right? And that's just one of the things like, and to build your life like that, what, think about, imagine a metaphor saying, my life is gonna be as expansive as Disney World and yet as precisely crafted such that there's not even a, a seven inch puddle anywhere to be mm -hmm. found. Yeah, and that reflects back to the culture, what we talked about yeah. with Drucker earlier. Culture is, uh, you know, what's the other thing? Culture is strategy. Culture is strategy for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's yeah. actually what he said. You're right. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. messed it up. So sorry, Peter. Well, it sounded really good the way you said it too. I wrote it down. I was like, that's good. <laughs> but, um, you know, he built in the culture and the culture of innovation, the culture of ideas, the culture of the standard of excellence um, as well. So it's just a beautiful illustration of like, hey, uh, build out the culture like as we're building out a business what is the culture that you want to reflect what's the environment like that you want to reflect like even in that for example for us and even in that tough season we still went to europe for a month nice um and the next year we weren't out of the hole yet we still went to europe for a month we went last year in the pandemic we were snuck into ireland Got, went to Ireland for six weeks, then we went to uh, Florence and Italy and other spots for another three weeks. So we were over in Europe longer than we'd ever been last year. And it's you just figure out, hey, what's the culture that you want for your home, for your work, for everything else, and uh, and then figure out how to how you're uniquely designed to contribute to it. That's so interesting. You say that um, in the origin story of of the business I have now. It was, again, it was born of a, of a challenge. I lost about 900 grand, got kind of screwed on a deal, had just sold my business. So my income had kind of fallen off a cliff. I didn't have it. You know, I was essentially banking, oh, I don't need income because I'm getting paid a couple million bucks. And suddenly half of it didn't get paid. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, but during that time, in fact, the month before we started actually selling courses here at Entra and we're able to start seeing at least some minimum amount of revenue, I, every summer for six years prior, I took my family to California for two weeks every summer. And we go, we go big, we go nice, we take 10 or 12, you know, two, my two boys are both teenagers, we take eight or 10, sometimes up to 12 of their friends. Oh, so we're yeah. talking, I got a big family, we take a nanny, like we're schlepping 18, 20 people to Southern California, stay in like in Newport Beach, or we'll stay in oh, Santa yeah. Monica, uh, West Hollywood, Coronado, the Hotel Dell in Coronado for two oh, weeks. Yeah. Like, you know, we're talking like 50, 60, I think, yeah. I think one year we is like $85,000 trips. <laughs> and I had no business taking that trip that yeah. summer, none. Yeah. But it was too important, like you say, man, why am I doing all this? I'm doing this to create magic for my family. I am not, the, the magic is not going to be the first thing out the window when times get tough. Yeah. You know, it was, and it was so important to me to do that. And I got, and I told my, the whole time I told my wife, I was like, when we get home, you're not going to see me very much, mm -hmm. but th this time is, sa is sacred and I was committed to it. But like, that's as soon cool. as we get home, it's go time. And, and that's, you know, uh, thus Entra was born. Like, I think that's so cool you say that. So you got into Europe last year? Yeah. I mean, can you share, like, do I dare ask you to share more <laughs> around that? Because that sounds like some full on like covert ops. Yeah, it was, I mean, my wife is like, you know, you and I are not rule followers, right? Like right. we're like, oh, the rules are not, they're meant for other people. We'll, <laughs> we're here to bend them, create them, whatever. Um, we get in, we go to Ireland, which is her favorite country. And she had done all the research because she's like a super fact finder. She does research. I don't do a lot of research. I do enough that I just feel good. Right. And I trust her. And so she said, hey, we're good. We're website, all that said, hey, you can come in just it's, but it was a little gray. We get to the Irish airport in Dublin and the security that uh, he says, hey, what are you doing here? Why are you here? You cannot come. You're, are you here for medical reasons? And she's, our excuse was, we're here for research for her book. Was, 
<laughs> she's not writing an Irish novel, but she was she was writing a novel. Um, and he said, I'm having trouble understanding why this is required for you to be here and like all so he gave us a little bit of hell and I thought he was gonna send us back. And we just I just said, babe, and I just kind of held firm. I was like, hold firm with certainty. You know, if you have certainty, you're gonna convince the other party. We eventually held firm and he just let us in. I think he just was frustrated enough and like go on. Yeah, that's and <laughs> and then we were there for three weeks. Like you have to quote quarantine for two or three weeks at the time. I can't remember how long it was, two weeks, I think. And then once you're in Ireland, now you're coming. When we went to Italy, we're coming and we went to England as well. So you're coming from another European country. Like I can't get into uh, Italy straight from America, but I could get into Italy from Ireland. Mm even with an American passport. So the, the gateway was going through Ireland because they had looser rules and at least a little gray window for, hey, you can come up, Americans could come over at the time. I don't know what it is right now, but. Huh. So, well, you know, it, apparently at at least one moment in one place in the world in 2020, reason actually prevailed. That's crazy, man. <laughs> I didn't know. I thought it was an entire yeah. year with no reason anywhere in the world, so. Uh, it's no, amazing. it's surprising, huh? Yeah, good for you. Good for you, man. You for, you thrust some sanity into the mix in in uh, in Dublin. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So, okay, um, and, and then yeah, talk to me a little more. And I know I know you got to um, go in about five minutes, so I'll just ask you one more question. Like, tell me more about this this travel. You go to a great city every year, and as I understand it, spend like a month just totally mm -hmm. nurturing self in a in a different city every year. You travel the world. What is it about that that's that's so revitalizing and and or essential? I don't even want to use revitalizing. That, that may not be the word, but like, what is it about that that's so essential for you? And when, how did you figure out that it was what you needed to pr protect for yourself? Good question. So uh, first, it, it kind of started. I read Four Hour Work Week, which most of us have, right. and I read it like four times in one year and a half period. And then I did my first mini sabbatical to Buenos Aires. Um, and was there for six weeks. Um, and that was when I was active in real estate and I figured out how to unplug. And I literally did not take one single work phone call after the first week for that time. Wow. Like, and, and so I unplugged, had things set up. It was beautiful. Uh, it was renewing, it allowed actually space for me to recreate myself at the time. Cause at, at that point I was three years into my real estate career. And I felt like if this is all I do, my soul is going to die. I'm made for something more. So next year, I came back, started three different businesses. One is socially minded car dealership. It went on for like seven years. We gave away cars to single mothers in need as well as part of our mission. That was kind of a fun, cool creation that I, I for the first time, really felt like I architected out an organization, a culture, and designed out this business cool. at a higher level. Um, then I was like, hey, I, I want to keep doing that. And I was also dating a French girl at the time. So uh, I had to go over to France for a month, uh, come over to London for a month. She came over here for a month, things like that. Um, and then, but then I, I fell in love with that. And I was like, hey, I also watched this TED talk called The Power of Time Off. That's Stefan Sagemeister. He's a top branding expert in New York. Hmm. And he would, he, he would take every seven years, he would shut down his whole branding and design firm, which is one of the top in New York City at the time, and shut it down for one entire year. And he literally put a sign in the, in the door, sign on the website, we're shut down for the next year until October 31st, 2020 or whatever. And people, he would come back and his team, he'd pay his team, they'd all be paid, they'd come back and they were stale in ideas and creativity at the time that they took, they left. They come back, they're uh, cutting edge, like creativity is flowing and the ideas and energy. So I like, hey, I love that. I can't, I don't know how to do a year yet, but I want to do a month. Now, yeah. I, I haven't fully, in the last several trips, I've worked while I'm there too. So it's, it's you know, I've, I've just relocated where I'm working. But um, even that alone, and, and being in, like, life is so short, I want to experience some of the most beautiful cities in the world. So we have a goal every year go back, go to one of the world's 50 most beautiful cities and be there at least a month. And the reason for a month is like you get to unwind and unpack and instead of the 
the headaches of traveling are the luggage, the suitcase, the mm-hmm. airports, the checking in, getting settling, readjusting to time zones. Where do you eat? Where do you, you know, is there a good Wi-Fi? Whatever, you know, all those things. And but if you're there long enough, like we were in Florence for a bit in September last year, and it was it was our favorite trip, mm-hmm. our favorite time to Florence, even though I've been there six or seven times. So I don't know where we're going to Florence again this year, just because it's frankly my favorite city in Europe and my wife loves it as well. Um, And we'll go somewhere else. So what we'll also do is when we go to one of those, the flagship city, like we did Barcelona two years ago, did um, uh, kind of did Florence the year before as well. But when we go to those uh, cities, we'll also pop in and see some other cities we haven't seen. And the book in back in. So we did, like uh, Copenhagen and Amsterdam and uh, all these uh, Milan and all these other cities. Uh, so this time we'll probably do Venice. We did Vienna. Vienna is actually an epic city. We have that on. Now we start accumulating. Oh, these are our next five cities we're going to go to. Cool. That's so cool. Yeah, man. I uh, I'd love to go to Vienna. I'm a classical musician. So. Oh yeah. Dude. Oh my you gosh. It's like my world happened there. Um, so great, man. I, yeah, my wife and I, we go to Vegas every, we go once a month for three days. So we'll usually yeah. a lot. And we actually go during the week. It's actually easier for us than weekends. Um, and it's Vegas. It's not like the most stimulating, <laughs> creative city in the world. But we go, we have our, we've created our little nest. We stay in the yeah. salon suite at the Wynn. We set up shop. Everybody there knows us. So we pull up, yeah. welcome back, Mr. And Mrs. Lerner. They just run our bag. Like it's so smooth. Yeah. And it's so necessary. And I, I just got back. I was 10 minutes late interviewing you because I just got back and my computer wouldn't work. I'm like so fired up because of those, just those little three days, you yeah. know? And it's crazy. I, I, I think if, if anybody could take anything away from my, my life and my work in general, and, and this conversation's a, a piece of that, like the tools and the opportunities exist in this world that the way Mike is talking about living, you can live that way. You can still make great money. You can create, you can design your life. We have got to shake off this old medieval model that life is hard and it's grueling and I have to carry bricks around all day. Like <laughs> you, businesses, there's businesses now don't even in, involve bricks. They don't even need a building, right? Yeah, exactly. Man, I wish we had more time. I know you have to go. Mike, you're a legend, dude. I love your approach to life. I love your approach, the, the work you're doing for people. How can people get more where can they go meet more mike yeah thank you uh my book uh website is the genius within um book.com mikezeller.com the mike zeller on instagram and you'll find me as michael zeller on linkedin and facebook as well and youtube um so pleasure jeff connecting and you know one of the things i i want to say as well is you know when we when we live with the rules that are handed to us instead of recreating rules, like you and I, we're recreating our rules, right? Like I said, hey, no, no matter my financial circumstance, no matter my business, I'm going to be in Europe or one other 50, 50 most beautiful cities in the world. And then I'm going to reverse engineer how I'm going to make it happen. Like we have a new, we'll have a newborn that will be three months old by the time we go to Europe this year. Wow. So we're yeah. working on, we're not letting that be an excuse. Wait till she's five or whatever. No. That's not, we're going to figure out, hey, can we get our, uh, my, my wife's 15-year-old sister over with us or whatever, who knows? We're going to figure out a way, an au pair, or whatever, so that we can enjoy our time, but also be present to our child. But we're not going to let that hold us back from experiencing um, the life we want to create. If you love entrepreneurship, then you'll want to keep watching. So click the next interview right here for some more Millionaire Secrets Gold. Thanks for watching. Begin something at the start. It's really fun. It's exciting. Then it gets really hard. And it's in that dip that most people just give up. You owe it to yourself once you make the commitment to go through with something to see it through the dip because everything that's good is on the other side of the dip.